Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for another Australian Fluid Mechanics Seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Matthew Seller from University of Canterbury. He is the head of department and also head of the group uh, working on interfaces and inverse problems there. And his main research focus is on free surface and multi-phase flows. And today is going to give us a talk on ubiquitous free surface flows from kitchen to volcanoes. Thank you. By that, I hand it over to you. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you for the um, introduction and um, the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about my uh, my work. And um, yeah, indeed, free surface flows uh, can be found in many places. And uh, today I'm going to talk uh, more specifically about um, two um, locations, the kitchen and uh, volcanoes, and you, you'll see uh, um, these applications uh, in a moment. But before doing that, I thought that I, I'd um, talk a little bit about myself, just very briefly, telling you a little bit about my background. Um, I'm originally from uh, Grenoble in, uh, in France, in the South East, which is where I did all my undergraduate studies. Um, and after that, I went to uh, the University of Leeds, which is where I did my, my PhD in mechanical engineering, working on the, the topic of thin films and, um, and droplets. And after that, I went to a um, front of an institute in Kaiserslautern, uh, work, um, and um, my research topic was around uh, modeling and controlling uh, glass forming um, processes. And from 2006, I've been uh, here in Christchurch, uh, New Zealand, um, in the Department of, uh, of, uh, of, of Mechanical Engineering. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about, uh, as you, about my, broadly my research topics, which uh, revolve around uh, interfaces and uh, inverse problems, uh, mostly. So I'll just give you a, um, a, 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 few, a few examples here. So um, most of my work um, involves the modeling uh, of, of free surface flows, like you, like you would see here on the, uh, on the bottom right hand side, where we were interested in, uh, in understanding how droplets impacting on a textured surface uh, evolves uh, over time. So this was uh, some work done with the, the lattice Boltzmann methods. Um, and here's a range of pictures illustrating various projects. Uh, so as I said, I'm, I've, I've been in, uh, interested in glass forming, which is what you see here at the top left. Um, I've, um, I've also been interested in a, a bloodstain pattern analysis. And we, we, we've been trying to uh, understand how droplets uh, impact on the surface, which is the, the video you see in the middle, um, which for some reason doesn't want to play, so it doesn't matter too much. Um, I, I've been, we've been interested in my group as well in uh, understanding evolving surfaces more broadly. So what you see here at the bottom left hand side is uh, uh, how a cylinder in cross flow evolves as, uh, as it erodes basically. And, um, here at the bottom right hand side is uh, some work we did around um, droplet microfluidics um, on, on surfaces. So the, the other area of interest for me uh, is, um, is inverse problems. I like to use uh, the analogy of forensic science to, to illustrate inverse problems. So, um, you know, if you look at the left hand side, you, you, you have um, uh, somebody being hit and, and some blood droplet being generated. Those blood droplets impact on the surface and, and generate um, generate a blood stain. And usually, sort of understanding the, the cause to effect relationships, so how we go from a droplet uh, to a stain, this is what we could refer to as the direct problem. Um, in that case, it's challenging enough, but we, we know a lot about it. On the other hand, if you're a forensic scientist, what you like to be able to do is just look at the droplet, uh, at the blood stain, and uh, sort of uh, uh, back calculate what uh, what was what happened before before that. So this is the inverse problem when you you have the the observation and you try to understand the, the cause. So in order to solve such inverse problem, you need a model, which is what we've got here uh, described by the Navier-Stokes equation, and you need um, observations. So um, I, I'll come back to that a bit later when I when I talk about. Uh, a uh, couple of specific projects. So it, it, uh, the kind of inverse problem we've been interested in is uh, are really relevant in geophysical flows. For example, we, here we've got a gla glacier flow and 
we can measure pretty well what's happening at the free surface, but not very well what's happening at the base. So we've developed methodology to, um, to solve such inverse problems for, for glacier flows, for river flows as well. And uh, recently we've been working on flow control, how to, how to um, eliminate the wake uh, from a cylinder and cross flow using uh, suction and, uh, and blowing. All right, so that um, hopefully sets the scene a little bit about um, the kind of research we do in, uh, in my group. Uh, today, I, so I, I want to talk to you about a couple of projects uh, at the interface uh, between free surface flows and inverse problem. The first one is to do with remote uh, rheometry and how just by looking at a, how a flow evolves, so a free surface flow, uh, can we try to deduce something about the reality of the fluids. So that's the that's sort of the first uh, problem I'll talk about. And the problem, the second problem, which has, uh, started as, um, as a bit of fun and ended up uh, looking at serious uh, problems was how to uh, sort of control a thin film on a surface. And uh, really we were interested in, in, uh, in, in, in pancakes and how to make pancakes, but I, it, it also applies to surface coating, which is what I'll talk about um, also. Okay, so the remote rheometry uh, problem I, I want to first talk about um, involves uh, quite a large team of people, which they, they're all listed here, and I'm not going to name them all, but uh, it's, a, it's a very multidisciplinary project uh, involving um, volcanologists, um, involving mathematicians, involving engineers like, uh, like myself. Um, and um, um, a lot of the work I, I am going to present is from uh, my former PhD student, Raman. So uh, I want to specifically mention his, uh, his name here. Um, so it's quite obvious when, when you look at, um, so here I've got a, uh, basically different fluids here uh, draining due to gravity um, in, uh, in test tubes. And it's quite clear that just by observing uh, what happens to the flow that those five fluids here all have different uh, rheology. So, so there is indeed a signature of the rheology that is visible just by observing what the free surface um, uh, does. Um, and so what we'd like to be able to do is just look at this, how this free surface evolves and, and say something about the rheology. Rheology, of course, is important in a large, in, in, in a broad range of contexts, um, whether you're talking about um, producing food, here I've got pasta, or ice cream, or if you're interested in uh, pouring concrete here, that's a photo taken um, at the University of Canterbury um, uh, some time ago, uh, or, or if you want to uh, manufacture glass, glass products, it's obviously also uh, very uh, important. And usually in order to, to infer rheology, you would use a rheometer, of course that's the, that's the tool of choice, and uh, here uh, you see uh, different types of rheometers with concentric uh, cylinders, cotton plates, and uh, and so on. Okay, um, so I guess that this is sort of my very introductory slides about uh, rheology. This is really uh, I'm sure I've got an audience of fluid mechanics, but uh, I'll, I'll just go through this slide anyway. Uh, if you if you um, um, in order to illustrate the different rheological behavior, if you had a block here with a certain mass flowing on a, a thin film, and let's say that it traveled um, at uh, velocity V1, uh, what would happen if the, suddenly you, you increase the mass of this block by a factor two, and therefore uh, increase the, the shear stress on the, on, the, on the surface by a factor two? How much faster would the block um, go down the, down, down the plane? And, uh, of course, if you got a Newtonian fluid, um, the, 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 the shear rate, well, the, the stress and shear rates are, are, are proportional to, to one another. So if you double the mass, you will double, double the, the, the velocity. Uh, if you've got a, a shear thickening fluid, that means that when you shear it harder, uh, the, the viscosity increases and therefore the velocity of the, the heavier block will not be equal to twice the, the velocity of the lighter block. And the shear thinning has got the opposite trend whereby the viscosity decreases as you um, increase the shear and therefore the velocity of the heavier block would be more than twice the velocity of the, the lighter block. Okay. Uh, 
elementary uh, uh, concept, really. But uh, uh, so, and this, uh, what I've just described, um, uh, can be rep represented here on that graph where we see the, the, the viscosity on the y axis as a function of the, of the shear rates on the x axis. And the, the, the Newtonian behavior obviously is a constant. And the, um, the, the sort of the shear thickening or dilatant fluid uh, is illustri illustrated by that blue curve and um, the, the, the shear thinning by this red curve. So the simplest rheological law that can be used to describe uh, such behavior is, um, is the power law, which you see here. And this power law has got two uh, parameters, which are K, the consistency factor, and N, the, the flow behavior uh, index. And unless you use a, a real meter, you wouldn't know this um, a priori. So uh, what we'd like to do is find a way to identify those uh, parameters. In, in, con in context where using a real meter is not really an option, and here I've listed a few, they're all related to uh, geophysical uh, flows, but there are others. You know, if you've got a, a slurry, such as a landslide, um, it's obviously not something that uh, you can easily put in a, in a viscometer. If you've got a lava, which is of particular interest to our project, it's very hot, it's very corrosive, it's not something that you would put in your real meter. If you have aerosol particles, often they are too small also to, um, to be able to, um, to make a sample to put in a real meter. So all, all those cases um, basically do not lend themselves to standard geometry technique and you, and you would like to find some um, alternative. And as I mentioned before, when you've got a free surface flow, the, the rheology of the fluids um, has an effect on the, on the free surface. So it sort of leave, leaves a, um, um, a signature on the free surface. And this is, this is what we see here. Um, this is a picture from a, a paper uh, of uh, Dietrich um, uh, et al, where, where we see basically lava meeting a wedge and uh, we've got nice uh, free surface velocity vectors here. And really the question we, we would like to be able to answer is, if all the information we had was this free surface velocity, can we say something about the, the real logic of the, of the fluid? So in order to test that, we, um, we looked at uh, the simplest possible problem we, we could think of. And uh, so, so we looked at the dam break problem, so the, which is what is illustrated um, on that picture here. So basically, we've got a gate uh, here which separates two pools of fluids of different heights. And at t equals zero, we pull that gate up and let the, the flow evolve by itself um, under, under gravity. And what we did is we seeded that, um, that fluid with polystyrene beads and we tracked the trajectory of the particles and use particle tracking velocimetry to deduce um, the Eulerian velocity uh, field. So I should mention that we use um, actually um, a software which is developed here at the University of Canterbury Streams, uh, developed by my colleague um, Roger Knox. And this is a very um, useful software available for all um, to, to download, uh, and it does particle tracking velocimetry. So here are a few sort of results which kind of provides the observations that we're going to use in our inverse problem. Um, the top left figures here shows uh, a bunch of trajectories of the, the beads at the free surface. And those beads, when they are close to the gates, uh, they, will, um, they will have a higher velocity than those beads which are far away, which is what we see here. The, the right hand figures basically shows um, and the Eulerian plots of the, the velocity magnitude. So this is immediately downstream of the, of the gates. And here on the x-axis, we've got the spanwise direction. So you see we've got a pretty uniform flow, which can be approximated as a unidire unidirectional flow. And the bottom picture here shows a bunch of um, velocity profile along the center line at different times. So you see at early times, we've got a high velocity, uh, which peaks near the near the gates, and as time evolves, we end up with this green big, um, sort of uh, uh, velocity, which is lower and has traveled uh, further downstream. So th this will constitute our observations. And as I said before, for our inverse problem, we also need a model. So uh, the model is what we've got here. So there's um, 
nothing really new about it. Uh, this, this is the Navier-Stokes equations. So we've got our power law rheology, which is the, our unknown, uh, with our unknown coefficients k and n. And we've got obviously a free surface flow, so we need a kinematic boundary condition and a dynamic boundary condition, uh, which uh, um, are reported here uh, in the tangential and, uh, and normal directions. Now, because in order to uh, identify those, um, those unknown parameters, we, we're going to need to run many simulations and running Navier-Stokes simulations with a, a free surface is, um, is costly. Um, we've, and gi given that the flow uh, is effectively uni unidirectional and um, um, relatively thin, so, so um, with, with, um, and it is with low inertia in that particular regime, uh, we've sort of adopted the lubrication approximation, which uh, basically simplifies the, the free boundary problem that we've got with the Navier-Stokes equation into a couple of partial differential equations, which, which you see here. A partial differential equation for the film thickness H and the pressure P. Okay, so this is, uh, you see this is highly nonlinear here because we've got um, um, here the divergence of the products of pressure gradients with the, with the, the film thickness. So this is highly nonlinear, but the main thing is that in this equation we've got the unknowns K and N, which are the, our rheological uh, unknowns. So for both the Navier-Stokes, the full Navier-Stokes um, uh, problem and the, the corresponding lubrication approximation, we use COMSOL to solve uh, both. Um, and we use uh, um, an a ALE uh, model for the, for the moving interface in the in the in the Navier-Stokes uh, module, and the, um, the coefficient form PD in in uh, in COMSOL allows you to solve um, very general partial differential equation. This is the general form here, uh, which um, we can uh, make our lubrication approximation uh, fit uh, into. Okay. Now for the, the parameter parametric identification. We will use uh, the lubrication approximation because of the front and the, and the failure, the sensor that is underneath. Because it solves uh, in a fraction of the time that would be required for the uh, Excuse me, there's somebody who's on his phone uh, being a bit louder here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and in, in terms of uh, identification uh, procedure, so basically we want to identify a couple of parameters, K and N, and what we want to do is minimize the mismatch between uh, the observation and the results of the model. Um, because it's a transient problem, we want to minimize the, the mismatch at uh, a number of time steps, which is what um, is written here. The sum from I equal one to N means that we are going to minimize the mismatch at a uh, number of, um, of time steps. Okay. And I guess the, 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 the PDE I gave you, the lubrication approximation, was in terms of the film thickness, but really what we measure in reality is the, is the, uh, the, the free surface velocity. Uh, the, free, the free surface velocity can be expressed in terms of the film thickness and, uh, and the pressure gradient, and this is the expression which we've got here. Now, you know, the first thing to do is uh, when you're sort of a do par parameter identification or, or inverse problem is just to ask yourself, is there a unique solution? So, so what, what you can do is, um, is sort of run what's called a twin experiment where basically you solve your, your direct problem with a given value of uh, N and K, which are our rheological parameters that will give you a, a free surface dynamic. And then you, you apply your um, parameter identification methods and you see if you can recover those, uh, those numbers. If the, 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 the problem has got a unique solution, that should be uh, straightforward. And this is what we see here on that uh, uh, graph, which plots the logarithm of the, the objective function. And so uh, this is what those quantiles show. And on the x-axis, we've got n, uh, and on the, the y-axis, we've got k. And those contours clearly show that we've got a minimum, and this minimum is correctly located at n equal 0.7 and k equal 0.4, which were um, 
the values we use for the direct problem. So this is a bit of a sanity check to, uh, to ensure that, um, that the problem has a unique solution. And this seems to imply that it does. Uh, if you introduce some noise uh, into the sort of the artificial um, experimental data, um, we see that um, these contour plots here still has a clear minimum, and this minimum is still uh, close to the, the required value for uh, the, um, the values of n and k of 0.7 and 0.4. So, so that means that the the problem is unique and appears to be robust to um, to noise in the in the in the input data. So then we did some uh, we used the data from our downbreak problem, which uh, used um, an, an accuracy serial solution. So this is a, a Newtonian fluid. So in some ways, uh, maybe that what well. So for obviously for this is a Newtonian fluid. So we expect n equal one, and when we measured in the real meter, we had uh, a value of k of 1.17 um, pascal uh, second to the power n. So this is the recording here from the from the real meter. What you see here on the right hand side again is the the contours of the objective function, and we see that the, um, we obtained a minimum of uh, the, the objective function for n equal one and k equal 1.13, which is very close to uh, what's expected from the, the measurement. So that was. Uh, uh, positive signs, sort of showing that uh, that the identification of those parameters um, is uh, is possible. Here we see what the, the velocity profiles look like. The the um, the, the symbols are the experiments, um, and the, um, sorry, one of the line is the the, so, the the solid line is the lubrication approximation and the dashed line is the, the, the Navier-Stokes equation. And you see that in the regions where we have measurements, we've got um, a good match between the, between, between the two. Now let me tell you a little bit about what we did to, uh, this is um, to, to, with actual lava, so um, hence the, the volcano connection. Uh, so, so um, well, I'll start by giving you a bit of a recipe about how to do lava in the, in the lab, and this is a work done by my colleagues, uh, volcanologists and, and geologists. Uh, this is, um, the powder you see here is, uh, is obsidian, which is a, a volcanic rock, and is mixed with a uh, flux, which is uh, basically lowers the, 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 the melting temperature. And for, uh, for what I'm going to show next, um, uh, we, we are assuming for now just a, re, uh, a Newtonian rheology, and, and all we are going to recover is the, um, is the viscosity. So the, 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 the mixture of obsidian uh, and flux is, uh, is put into a, a crucible. This crucible is uh, put into a, a very re rudimentary furnace, which we see here, to, to, to melt the, the mixture. And then we pour it either on a V-channel or uh, we let it uh, drop as a gravity current on a, on a, on a horizontal plate. And we took advantage of um, the work of Takagi and Huppert, uh, who derived uh, as, um, a solution um, for the location of the front of the of a gravity-driven uh, finger in a, in a V-channel. This is what the, the 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 similarity solution effectively looks like. And you see that so Zn here is the location of the front, and you see that the location of the front depends as the, temp, the square root of the, the time. And you see that you've got a big prefactor here. In this prefactor, everything is known uh, except the viscosity. So if by doing experiments, you get a relationship between the, the front location and uh, t to the power one half, that gives you a way to recover the viscosity, which is what we've got here. Uh, on the top left graph, we see the location of the fronts on the, uh, the y-axis and on the x-axis, we've got a square root of time. We get a nice straight line, the slope of which allows us to estimate the, the, the viscosity. And here we see the viscosity um, as a function of uh, the amount of flux which is put in the, in the mixture. And what we know uh, is that uh, as we uh, increase the, the amount of flux, the viscosity should decrease, which is what we uh, indeed see here. Um, so in order to sort of cross 
validate our results, we also did the same experiment as, as I said before with the gravity current, which is basically a, a, a spreading pool of, um, of lava. And here again, uh, uh, in a classical paper by Huppert uh, from the, the early 80s, uh, there, there is a similarity solution for the rate of uh, spreading or the, or the radius r as a function of time. And I won't go into too much detail, but if, if you use this similarity solution again to estimate the, the viscosity, you get the, um, uh, the, the, the blue curve here and the, 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 the measurements that we obtain from the V-channel are con reasonably consistent with the one we had from the, 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 the gravity-driven uh, pool. So that's, uh, that was um, a positive sign. Okay, uh, so some sort of preliminary, preliminary, preliminary sorry, conclusions on this work. So uh, the free surface obviously seems to contain in, enough information to infer uh, unknown real, rheological information. Um, there are some um, challenges. I mean, first of all, uh, generating high quality observation can be can be difficult. Uh, generating mo good models with uh, which can be solved efficiently so is, uh, is also a challenge and here we've made some a priori assumptions about the rheology of the of the fluid assuming that this is a power, a power law we would like to um, sort of uh, um, do away with this uh, this assumption um, and this is sort of what a uh, this is where our project is heading so we recently uh, obtain a grant, a Marsden uh, grant from the New Zealand government uh, to sort of expand this work and uh, obviously the rheology of lava is more complicated than what I've described before. Uh, in fact, it's often described with a Herschel Buckley um, rheology where, whereby there is a yield stress in the, in the lava and on top of um, this yield stress um, so um, we also have the fact that the, the consistency factor and the yield stress are functions of the temperature and the uh, and the and the, the composition. So, so what we're aiming to do is um, take field measurements of the the velocity and deduce a rheological um, uh, parameter. So this is uh, this is sort of work in progress. I, I'm going to move now to the second part of my talk, uh, which, as I said before, is um, well, initially started talking started as a bit of a, uh, a fun project around how to make a good pancake, and then when it went into how to um, coat a surface with a with a uniform uh, film thickness. Okay, so uh, so um, I'll first talk a little bit about this. Um, well, his, historically, where we started, and um, so wh wh when I talk about pancake, really, I mean. Um, French French crepes because here on the left hand side you see uh, the, I guess a um, continental distinction between the pancake here the American pancake which are big uh, fat and not really hard to do because all you need to do is, uh, is put them on the plate and let them cook if you want to make your uh, a very thin crepe the sort of the traditional way um, uh, as, as you would have them in France, uh, you, you need to uh, coat your pan with a, with a uniform layer of butter. And there's typically two ways to do it. In France, we've got a, a system which is, well, uh, a traditional one, which is based on the a similar process to blade coating, where we've got, whereby we've got a roselle, which is basically used to spread the butter in a uniform way. But the way most people do would just be to put the butter in the, in the plate and then uh, sort of rotate the plate in some clever way to try to have an optimal coverage on the on the pan. And this is this is what sort of prompted uh, our question initially with with my colleague uh, Edouard Bougeau um, from uh, EPFL. The question was how can we? What is the best way to rotate your pan to to coat the pan uniformly with the the butter? Um, I should have mentioned as well. Uh, so this is uh, collect, um, joint works with Edouard Bougeau and uh, student uh, Ross uh, Shepard and, um, and my postdoc uh, Céline Durek. Um, so th there's a number of um, other contexts where when a, a film of fluid spreads, the kinematics of the surface on which it spreads is important or the fact that it's um, 
obviously when, when the, the batter cooks, it solidifies. So a uh, lava is another example of a flow where the, the layer solidifies as it, as it spreads. Spin coating is an example where the, the kinematic of the substrate is very important to the dynamics of the, of the, of the, of the flow. And here I've got a couple of other examples. Wing icing is also another uh, example where the, the fluid, as, it's dra as it goes over the, over the, the wing, solidifies. Okay. So um, let me talk a little bit now about the modeling framework and how we went about modeling the, the sort of the, the, the batter spreading on the, on, on, on the pan. So, so you could do one of, one of two things. You could just uh, uh, basically have your liquid on the surface and try to, um, and try to rotate your, your surface in order to, uh, to, to, to see what happens. But because the, the actually a much easier thing to do is to say that uh, you are in a reference frame which is attached to the, um, to the pan effectively. And, and therefore, with, because the, the, the flow is gravity driven, the effect of gravity is simply a consequence of the fact that when you project this gravity vector in this fixed reference frame, which is uh, attached to the, uh, to the pan, uh, basically creates um, a gravity, components of gravities, which are functions of uh, time. So this is, I've got the acceleration G here, which when projected on X, Y, Z, gives me um, the, the, the three components, uh, which are basically driving the, 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 the fluid down the pan. Um, so the, the solidification of the, the, the the batter is basically modeled by having a temperature dependent viscosity. And the, the kinematic of the pan is basically described by two angles, beta and theta, which are functions of time. And really the problem we're trying to solve is what are the optimal uh, distributions, beta of t and theta of t, in order to uh, obtain a uniform, um, a uniform layer, okay? In terms of uh, modeling, so we've got a thin film and Again, so um, typically we're, we're going to work with lubrication type approximation, so inertia is negligible. So our momentum equation simplified to what we've got at the top here, where we've got a balance between um, shear stresses, pressure gradients, and our acceleration of gravity here, which is dependent on, our, on the angles theta and beta. Um, Obviously, we've got no slip at, this, at the surface and zero shear at the free surface. In terms of heat transfer, we are assuming that we've got a small Peclet number. So basically, convection is negligible, and therefore the temperature distribution across the thickness of the, of the butter is just purely diff driven by diffusion. And in which case, we've got the simple um, ordinary differential equation uh, for the temperature, uh, where the temperature is equal to the substrate temperature Ts at the surface. And at the free surface, we've got free convection to um, sort of cool our fluid. With the simple equation that allows us to calculate a temperature distribution, which is a function of the location within the, the, the thickness and um, uh, H. So th this temperature distribution T is related to the film thickness H. And here we've got our convective heat transfer coefficients. We've got our thermal conductivity. Uh, but uh, so basically, this is um, this is our temperature distribution. This is uh, how our, our viscosity depends on the on the temperature. In terms of the hydrodynamic, if I um, using the lubrication approximation that I described before allows us to calculate the discharge Q, which is just the integral of the velocity vector, and after. Uh, uh, quite a few lines of algebra. Basically, you you, you can um, lump all this into a single partial differential equation. Um, I'll show you this partial. This uh, this partial differential equation is basically illustrated um, here at the top of this um, uh, of this slide, where we've got the, the rate of change of the the batter thickness plus the divergence of the flux is equal to zero, and this flux is um, related to this vector k and this vector k uh, sort of 
and codes all information related to the orientation of the of the pan theta and beta. So this is a uh, how it again it's implemented in console. We, you you got down at the bottom here a sketch of the computational domain uh, meshed with the finite element methods, and we basically put a uh, um, the, the the lump of fluid at the at the center of this pan and let it evolve um, uh, as a function of time. Now I guess the first question is what would happen if we if we had zero control, if we didn't control the flow at all, and just basically put the banner in the middle and let it spread on its own, and therefore we've got an axisymmetric problem here. And the measure of uniformity is described here. It's basically the, the integral over the domain of the difference between the film thickness and the optimal value of the film thickness, which is just the volume of the banner you put divided by the surface area of the pan. And what you see, uh, here the label are uh, fast cooking and slow cooking. Basically, what we do is play with the the, the convectivity transfer coefficient. And when things very cook very quickly, you see that the the uniformity measure here um, is described by the blue line um, is worse than when the the batter cooks slowly. And that, and, and that makes sense because. When the batter cooks slowly, the, the, the batter will spread further on the pan, and therefore we expect to have um, a more uniform uh, film at the at the end. Okay, so in, in the following, what we're going to try to with the control, what we're going to try to improve is this fast cooking curve here, which uh, tells you, um, yeah. So basically, if we're using optimal kinematic control we can have a curve below this blue curve that will means that we can improve the uniformity of the of the bottom and the first thing we did was just to have a parametric kinematics of the pan which is given here by theta and beta our angle describing the orientation of the pan described basically by simple harmonics with a given amplitude a1 and given period t2 so then what you can do is just basically do a optimization in order to find the optimal of those four parameters which minimize the objective function. And we use basically a simple Monte Carlo method, do a whole bunch of uh, realization and, and pick the optimal one. And this is uh, the best one from 2000 realization. The left-hand curve here shows, shows theta and beta, the orientation uh, axis of the pan. And we see that uh, we've got sort of those two signals and that kind of indicates that we are sort of um, incl inclining the pan in one direction at um, twice faster in one direction than the other. Uh, what you see on the right hand side is how the film evolves over time. So the, you should read that from top left to bottom right. So initially the red dot here is where all the butter is concentrated. The arrows here indicate the orientation of the pan, and you see that uh, at t equal delta t, the film has drained towards uh, the, the top boundary of the pan. And then, the, so here the red zone is where we've got a thick batter. And then this red zone is sort of, uh, turns around the rim of the pan. And at the end, things look fairly uniform, but uh, it's kind of a bit hard to tell from that. And uh, this is the corresponding, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to, Okay, I'm sorry, this, this, this should be a video, but for some reason, it does not want to play it. Um, ah, let me try it. Okay, this is the dynamics of the, the butter as it flows on the pan here. Okay, and the, the, again, the vectors indicates the direction of the inclination. And what you see is that with the, the best Monte Carlo, um, but we, we obtain sort of this dashed, um, we obtain this curve here, which eventually um, leads to an improvement uh, of the uniformity at our final time. So, so this was some improvements, though a rather modest improvement. So we wanted to know if we can do better. Uh, the bottleneck of this, um, this problem is the, is the optimization. Here, we're sort of um, constrained by the, the sort of the, the form of kinematics we've imposed uh, by those sine and uh, sine and cosine um, functions. Ideally, you would want to have controls, theta and beta, which are absolutely arbitrary, but the, the difficulty is how to, 
calculates the, the, the what's called sensitivity. So basically, how your objective con uh, function depends on those controls uh, theta and uh, and beta. So in order to do that, uh, we use the, basically the optimal control theory. And I'm not going to go in a great amount of detail, but basically the idea is to define an objective function. Here, there's nothing new. This is the same objective function as we had before, with this term here indicative of the uniformity. So this is how far the film thickness varies from the optimal film thickness. We've got a cost here because we don't want our, the inclination of our pan to be too high. And the way, and we want to minimize this objective function subject to the constraint of you see that we need to satisfy the governing partial differential equation. So in order to solve this sort of a, a constraint optimization problem, there is, there is a classical way of doing that is to transform this into an unconstrained problem by using a Lagrange multiplier. So here we've got, um, a, we've introduced like a Lagrangian which is the objective function plus um, a Lagrange multiplier that multiplies our constraint and the constraint is our governing equation. Okay, So these this two formulations of the problems are strictly speaking the same. But then when we look at, um, when we do a bit of calculus of variation, you see that when you take the variation of this um, Lagrangian with respect to the Lagrange multiplier, which is also called the adjoint variable, we basically recover the uh, sort, of, sort of our governing equation. When we take the variation of the Lagrange multiplier with respect to our state variable, which is the film thickness, we obtain the adjoint equation, uh, which is basically a linear partial differential equation with a terminal boundary condition. And when we take the, um, the gradients, uh, sorry, the, the, the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to the controls, so the angles theta and beta, uh, we, we obtain this expression, which basically allows us to e evaluate the sensitivities. So in terms of how we go about uh, solving this problem, we first assume a control C for the angles theta and beta, that allows us to calculate the film thickness uh, H. And then given the control and the film thickness, we can uh, obtain our adjoint variable, which is, um, also um, known as the language Lagrange multiplier. And with this knowledge, we can then calculate the gradient of the objective function. And then we can apply gradient data optimization, gradient based, sorry, optimization to, to minimize our objective function. So we've done that, we've implemented that in, a, in, in console. And uh, we obtain a much faster convergence. So here only 10 to 30 iteration was were needed with one adjoint calculation. And, um, uh, the, the results of this optimization is what you see um, here at the bottom left. So this is the, the kinematics that you, the optimal kinematics, so the optimal theta and beta inclination angle, which gives the, the best uh, sort of a uniformity of the film thickness. And it, um, I guess in order to describe what it looks like, um, this is um, again uh, an animation showing where the film goes uh, as you rotate the pan. And it sort of does a little bit intuitively as you would do in reality, which is you bring the fluid at one end of the, the pan and you sort of rotate it around such that the, the thick fluid rotates around the, around the, the pan. And if you look at the, the performance, this is uh, what you see on the right hand side. Um, again, the sort of the black dashed line is when we didn't apply control, and the, the blue line is the uniformity measure when the control is applied. And here you see that we have a substantial improvement of the uniformity, which is uh, maybe best illustrated here, where we see the uncontrolled case and anything that is covered here is part of the film where the film thickness is somewhere between plus or minus 5% of the des desired film thickness. So when it's uncontrolled, only a small portion of the plan is within that range. With the adjoint formulation, uh, we see that we've got a much greater proportion of the pan, which is covered by a film within the desired uh, range. So this is um, um, a sign that the, the optimization has done as, 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 it, um, as it should. Now, I'll just talk very briefly about where this is going and the connection with coating. The connection with coating is quite clear because 
when people are interested in coating application, they are, they are also interested in coating surfaces with a uniform uh, layer. And um, uh, coating a, a flat surface with a uniform layer is, um, is possible. It's been done for a long time using a process known as pink coating, for example. But coating a surface with a, a, a curved surface with a, a uniform film thickness is much harder. So, so what we've been trying to do, and we've recently got a grant to, to achieve this, is say, okay, can we also try to optimize the kinematic of the substrate in order to optimize a uniform, in order to obtain a uniform coating on the, on the curved surface? Um, so I'll, I'll um, so I'll just, I guess, um, I, I don't want to go too fast, but it's a spin coating, just a, a bit of a summary of what spin coating is. We've got, the idea is basically to put a bit of fluids on the surface, spin the surface very quickly. By centrifugal force, the, the film spreads and generates um, a uniform film, which um, then evaporates, and then you're left with a, a uniform coating and this is used routinely in manufacturing solar cells, circuit boards or LED displays uh, are typical applications. But if you want to do that as on curved surfaces, as I said before, this, this does not work because you end up with um, a non-uniform uh, film thickness if you rotate around a single uh, axis because effectively the centrifugal force and gravity force on the surface are no longer uh, uniform. So what we um, so in, in, in our, what we want to do is find the, an, an optimal kinematics to obtain a uniform thickness. And the first thing we wanted to do is okay, let's look at a sphere that uh, rotates around a single axis, and let's see if we can optimize the rate at which this sphere rotates in order to obtain uh, a uniform um, film. Again, we're going to use um, the lubrication approximation to describe how the film evolves around the, around the sphere. And uh, we are going to assume a temperature dependent viscosity to represent the sort of the curing process. And when um, you go through the, the asymptotic analysis to, to, to bring out the leading order terms in the Navier Stokes equation, uh, you end up with this equation here that you see at the bottom, which describes the evolution of the film thickness as a function of the polar angle phi, which is um, basically the angle from the North Pole to the, to the, to the South Pole. So you see that this um, differential equation, which is again a force order dif differential equation, includes surface tension, gravity, and the centrifugal force key dimensionless number are the bond number and the Galileo number. Um, I'll just show you um, quickly what the, what the solutions look like. Here we've got um, on the left hand side a film that drains due to gravity alone and therefore you see that the film, by the way this has been exaggerated just for the purpose of visualization, and you see that the film thickens uh, at the southern hemisphere because the film drains by gravity. And when you uh, introduce um, a centrifugal force uh, along the, the vertical axis, you see that the, the film thickens around the, uh, around the equator. Uh, and that's obviously a result of the, uh, of the centrifugal uh, force. So we, we applied the same sort of um, optimal control theory to this particular problem. Uh, and um, Again, uh, our control being the rate at which the, the sphere uh, rotates. And uh, we, want to, um, we want to minimize the, the difference between the, the actual film thickness and the optimal film thickness. And um, I guess I, 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 I want to show you quickly that the adjoint based way of calculating the sensitivity has been validated against uh, sort of finite difference equivalents of the, of the adjoint, sensi adjoint sensitivity computation. And um, I guess in that particular case, uh, uh, what we, this plot here shows what the optimal angular velocity ought to be in order to, um, 
improve the improve the, the, the film thickness. The problem is that when you look at the, the objective function, you see that with gravity alone or with the control, we've not made a huge difference in terms of uniformity. So there is still uh, quite a lot of work to do, and this is a sort of work in progress that um, uh, that we've started uh, recently. And um, yeah, so uh, here I've got a few concluding uh, remarks. Um, which, uh, in the interest of time, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go over. But if you're interested in some of this work, we've got a couple of recent papers here, which um, give you a lot more details about uh, about this. And um, I just want to quickly acknowledge uh, uh, the Royal Society of New Zealand, uh, which has funded some of this work, and the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Enterprise in New Zealand, which has also funded some of this work. And um, many of my collaborators and uh, students that you see on this, uh, on this picture. And um, I will conclude now. Thank you for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, to open the floor for questions, please unmute yourself and ask questions if you have any questions. Well, I guess why people gathering the talks, I was just going to ask one question maybe. How yep. is the computational cost for these simulations? If you want to go for a joint and doing the iteration in the industry relevant problem. Well, uh, um, so, so, so in the, in the, in the other cases, I sh I sh well, in, in, the, in the cases of it, it, okay, so the short answer is it's pretty quick because uh, really what you're doing is solving um, a partial differential equation in one or two dimensions, and uh, you're, you're solving it. Um, okay, you're solving a transient problem, but uh, but still it's pretty cheap compared to solving the full Navier-Stokes equation. So so solving your your direct problem is cheap when you're using the lubrication approximation and solving the adjoint uh, problem is also is also reasonably uh, cheap and that that's that is the reason we've sort of um uh well we're dealing with problem where the lubrication approximation is suitable because if you have to do that with the full navier stokes equation this would be a huge computational cost you know but but it, i guess if you to answer your, your question in terms of numbers and um, you know solving the the the, the 2d Lubrication approximation can be done in a matter of, uh, you know, less than a minute, and you can do that for for the direct problem and the inverse problem. Can I ask a question? So, um, you talked about extending the kind of problem with inverting for the rheology. Yeah. Um, and if you have a more complicated rheology, and you start adding in more free parameters, do you start getting non-uniqueness when you invert? Uh, I, 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 um, I expect you do, and in, in fact, uh, the, the, the problem I've just described here with the power law, we've, um, we've also um, tried it with, with a three-parameter description of the, of the, of the rheology, and, and, and did find that, yes, indeed, then uh, you, you have a um, unicity problem, and you, are, you have a lot more, your objective function space becomes a lot more complicated with a lot more uh, uh, you know shallow valleys which obviously will create problems for any optimization um, algorithms so yes you're, you're, this is correct that this is a challenge okay thank you yeah. thanks John. I'm happy to take any other questions if anybody's got any. I might ask one more question. If yep. you're going for next step, I guess the main goal is using these sort of tools in industry. Are you going to develop it as a, a software package or is it going to be cloud-based uh, algorithm or is it going to be depend on console? How it's going to be in the future? Yeah, that's um, 
the commercialization aspect is, uh, is an interesting, well, yeah, interesting one. I mean, at the moment, we're just interested in doing some interesting science. So, um, and, uh, but when, when um, yeah, I mean, there, there is the, um, Comsol is a very nice tool because uh, from my point of view, it, it, it allows you to solve problem very quick, very quickly. And, uh, um, but, uh, but of course it's a commercial tool. Um, but I guess at, at the moment we're sort of using it as a, as a, as a, as a proof of concept, you know, to show, Hey, can we do it? Um, I think once we have been past this stage, it is actually not, um, not a big, well, not a big job, at least a possible job to, to code, you know, basically we're just solving a non, a highly nonlinear uh, diffusion equation of fourth order. You know, you could, you could code techniques that, that does that, that does that. And I, we've, I've done it in the past, many have done it in the past. So, so when it comes to actually an implementation for, um, you know, uh, for, 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 for commercial application, I think this could be, this could be done. Maybe one more question. Have you been tempted to do this in the sense of doing it in detail using Navier Stokes equation with the volume of fluid method for the phase change condition and stuff like that? Or, um, yes, yeah, so all the problems I've, I've, I've shown here, we've always sort of done. Um, at the same time, Navier Stokes equation because we can we can solve this uh, using an ALE method, uh, so a moving mesh method, um, and uh, so so we can um, we can and we have solved them using the Navier Stokes uh, the full Navier Stokes solver. The um, the agreement between the two um, in the in the range of parameters we considered was always very was always very good, uh, but in terms of computational time we're talking um orders of magnitude difference uh you know but in your numerical solutions of navier stokes yep. did you use two phase flow or is it was just single phase with the boundary condition for the interface it, it, it is it is uh it is still well it is still two phase though we only uh basically so so it is an evolving flow domain uh, but we, um, I guess we, you know, you, you, you're talking about, um, about phase field that methods, phase field that methods, uh, assume two phases here. We only model the liquid phase and we, because obviously the, the surrounding gas phase is not, uh, affecting the dynamics of the liquid uh, all that much. So, so we can, the, the, the ALE methods, so arbitrary Lagrangian and Lenin allows you just to work with a, with a deforming mesh which deforms as the as the interface evolves. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? If not, maybe we thank our speaker again. That was a great talk and thank you for giving this presentation and see you next week. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.